Professor Thibault Chappelle, who's an Associate Professor of Law at VU Amsterdam and a faculty affiliate at Stanford University's Codex Center. Uh, Professor Chappelle also holds research and teaching positions at the University of Paris I, uh, Pantheon Sorbonne, and Science of Paul Paris, and he is an alumnus of Harvard University's Berkman Center, a member of the French Regulatory Authority and Audiovisual for Audiovisual and Digital Communication Scientific Board, and a blockchain expert appointed to the World Economic Forum and the World Bank. Uh, he is widely pub published, and his most recent book, Blockchain and Antitrust, came out in 2021. Um, we'll give the time over to Professor Chappelle, um, and then after that, I've got, um, I've actually monopolized the dialogue on this one because I found um, his work so interesting. Uh, we'll have a, uh, what might amount to a fireside chat after his uh, opening remarks. Um, and as usual, if you have questions, just raise your hands as we go, and I'll make sure to get you in the queue. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. It works. Great. Um, I think it's the first time I'm in a room with so many friends and people who all know are a lot of fun. So um, it feels great. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I woke up not so early this morning in Amsterdam, jump on the train. I know that some of you came from the United States, so I'm very grateful for your time. Um, I'm also very excited about the Fireside chats, uh, not especially about my own presentation because I know what I'm going to say. Uh, but I hope that you'll find it interesting. Uh, as you can see on the screen, there are three subjects that I want to cover. The title of the keynote being entitled Com Complexity-Minded Antitrust. First, I want to explain why did I get interested um, and why did I decide one day to research the subject? Then what does it mean? And uh, what can we expect from this kind of mindset in antitrust? and then try to see if there are already frameworks, tools that we can apply in 2023, right? As opposed to coming up with the conclusion that it's all complicated or that it's all complex and that therefore there is nothing we can do. So that's a bit of the, the structure of what I want to, to discuss. Um, what I should mention first is that this work on complexity and antitrust is actually uh, co-authored with Nicolas Petit, who is a professor at the EUI. I put a picture of us two over here. Uh, this is us, I think, in early February of this year in Arizona, um, walking around the 10 meters high cactus. Um, and the reason why I put the picture here is that we traveled the United States in February of this year to actually present what is part two of our research on the subject, today being part one. Um, but the plan is to publish a following paper and then a third, and then eventually try to, to combine all that. Um, so if Nicola is watching us, I hope you're well. Um, and uh, please keep in mind that again, I will speak of course in my own name, but this work is co-authored uh, with Nicola. Um, now, the reason why we got interested, and this took actually us three to four years of discussions pretty much on a daily basis, to come up with this idea and this desire to research complexity theory, um, we came to the, the conclusion that most of what we do in antitrust, when there is a situation where A or several companies have market power, is that we usually ask the question whether or not that position is explainable by monopoly or by the efficiency of the firm. Right? And this is much of what we hear usually, um, one being usually an exclusion of the other. In the mind of certain person, the two can be combined. Um, but in any case, this is the terms, those are the terms of our discussion in, in antitrust. And when trying to answer the question as to whether, let's say, Google or Amazon and Facebook are in a situation of monopoly, um, entrenched monopoly, or if they are in such position because they are efficient, Usually you hear a broad range of concerns when it comes to the errors that we may do in our analysis and also the cost of taking action based on the answer to this question, whether or not the firm is again here because of monopoly power or uh, some efficiencies. So this is what we see in the space. Um, now, what we see also at the same time is that out there, meaning outside of the antitrust world, uh, there is what we think 
can be labeled as being the complexification of the economy. And by that, we mean complex in, in the sense of complexity theory. Uh, what we see is that there is an increasing number of transactions um, and that for each product and service, you need actually more interactions with other business partners than what used to be the case, let's say, 100 years ago when you were just a farmer doing stuff on your own, on your own field, right? And the reason for that is because there is a decoupling of information and matter. I'll just give some examples. Um, virtual world, the metaverse. Um, this is a good example where if they are to develop, we are not biased, maybe they won't, but if they are to develop, then indeed more transactions will be implemented because you will have the transaction in our so-called real space. Now, we may live in a computer simulation. I don't know if you ever read Nick Bostrom on the subject, but putting that aside, we will have our uh, physical uh, interactions plus the one in the metaverse, right, in virtual world. Uh, the same is true for new forms of value capture. And here, I cannot resist but to talk about NFT. I don't have pictures of NFTs. Uh, you may want to explore that on your own. Um, but an NFT is fundamentally an access right. So you buy the right to access something, whether it is that you want to access property of a picture online, or maybe that you want to use the NFT to access something in the physical world, right? But again, this is a good example where outside of the NFTs and outside of blockchain ecosystems, um, it's very unlikely that I can convince you to, let's say, sell this picture to you. Why? Because you can just copy paste the picture and you have the exact same one. If I made an NFT out of this picture, then it may create some value, at least in the eyes of some people. And therefore we may have a transaction and you may be willing to buy the picture, especially if you know that in a few years from now, you can sell the same picture for a much higher price to another person in the room, let's say. So more transactions again. Um, and of course, this leads me to blockchain ecosystems where you see that generally speaking, smart contract and blockchain are used to replace some of the transactions that we have outside of blockchain ecosystem, but also according to the World Economic Forum and the IMF, blockchain are actually triggering new transactions and they predict that by 2025, blockchain would have increased the total number of world transactions by about 7%. The number may be wrong, it might be six, it might be 2%, but you get the idea of more transaction, right? If you are interested in visualizing all that, there is a great explorer that you may want to use. I've put the link over here, and by the way, I'm more than happy to share my presentation if you want to access the different uh, items that I've mentioned. Uh, this one is uh, developed by the Center for International Development at Harvard University. And what you may do here is click on a country and see how many transactions the country is having with other countries, which sectors are concerns, and you can measure that all the time. And you see that indeed countries engage in more transactions in 2023 than what used to be the case in, let's say, 1990, right? So we have this complexification of the economy, and we have our old fashioned way of applying antitrust, where we always ask is it a monopoly or do I see efficiencies? Now we think that this is creating a mismatch and the speed by which the economy evolves puts together next together to our rules and our mindset in antitrust is creating a problem. At best, we think that this problem may be non-satisfactory and at most it may be absolutely absurd. I have some example here on the slide. Um, if you read carefully what the European Commission is saying in Google Android, it says that Apple iOS and Google, the operating system for smartphones, smartphones are not competitors, right? They are all dominant. The two of those companies are dominant on their own ecosystem, which means that if tomorrow Apple iOS is to announce buying Android, this will be deemed non-problematic because there are non-competitors, right? And we think this is absurd to think about it in those terms. Another example that was mentioned already this morning is the one of Giphy and Facebook. Um, the CMA is telling us that those are not horizontal competitors, but vertical competitors and may exert some competitive pressure, fine. 
But 10 years before, the um, OFT was telling us that Instagram is not a competitor to Facebook. So now what's the difference between the two? Those two transactions, I'm not too sure. And again, this is where there is a mismatch between the evolving of the economy and the way by which we apply antitrust. The Microsoft case, we don't have the time, but I'm sure if I was to ask whether or not the Microsoft decision in the US or in Europe was effective in creating more competition, some people would say yes in the room or online, and some other people would say absolutely not. Um, this has been 20 years that we have those decisions and we yet can't agree as to whether they were effective, right? We think that the reason why we have a disagreement is because, again, we don't have the right mindset and we don't use the right uh, lenses. The very last one, TikTok, I'm sure you are familiar with it. Discord, maybe not everyone in the room. Be real, I'm not too sure if you are familiar with it. I'm told by very young friends um, in high schools and uh, starting law school that this is the social media to be used, right? Um, but again, if you use the actual mindset, you may see those companies as being part of separate markets and therefore not competitors. Um, the problem we have with that is that for the last 70 years, we have seen literature explaining that firms have to make a choice as to whether they choose to be efficient, which is to explore the frontier that they have defined, or to innovate. And usually, indeed, they have to make a choice between the two. Being efficient doesn't mean being innovative, right? And this kind of literature is totally absent, at least from what we've seen in the antitrust debate, and we think that it has some sort of utility that we can bring uh, to the table. Now, some people, and of course we are not the first, have seen this mismatch, and as a reaction are proposing new ways to conceive antitrust and to apply the rules. And we hope it's fair to say that the two leading groups are represented behind me right now. On the left, you have the neo Brandeisans. What they do well, and this may be contentious, but in our view, what they do well is that they understand that the economy is indeed a complex system where you have lots of different agents, infrastructures that are the constitutional rules of the economy, and that control of the infrastructure may impact all of the other layers on top of it, right? Linekan does that pretty well in the Amazon antitrust paradox. What we think they do not do well, or not good enough, is to tra translate that reality into the realm of antitrust. And in fact, the precise name of their movement, School of Thoughts, Neil Brandeisens, says all you need to know in the space where they do say themselves that Justice Brandeis, already 100 years ago, wrote on a piece of paper exactly what you would need to do in today's economy. And we think this is overly simplistic and negate, again, the complexity of the economy and therefore does not go in the right direction. This is one group. The other group are, or is, what we will call the Neo-Chicagoans. And in their mindsets, it's all about efficiency. Um, you can see that even in the mindset of some antitrust agencies, the word efficiency appears quite a lot. And what you will hear is that the big tech companies, let's say, are in such a position because they are more efficient, right? That's the number one reason. And we see that usually it leads to a, pronounce the, the French way, laissez-faire uh, approach. Um, and indeed, in a sense, they are doubling down on what the Chicago schools developed in the 70s, before the complexification of the economy to the degree that we are experiencing today. So we are not too pleased with those two approaches, and this leads us to the complexity-minded antitrust. If you want to take a picture, this was published finally a few weeks ago in the Journal of Evolutionary Economics. It's open source, uh, that's why I took the liberty to, to put it there. Um, and here what we try to develop is a way in between of the two schools that is actually computing the complexity of the economy and coming up with a framework that agencies can apply because indeed we also come from, we are also of the opinion that in recognizing that innovation is important, most of the economists and lawyers have stopped their work precisely after this remark. This is certainly the case of Joseph Schumpeter, mentioned quite a few times today. He does nothing of institutions. They are not even mentioned in his you know, view of the world and how they may shape the economy. 
and certainly does not provide regulators with a framework telling them what to do of dynamic competition and innovation competition when they are facing facts and they have to make a decision, let's say, in Microsoft Activision. So that's precisely what we are trying to achieve. I'm not saying that we did achieve that, uh, but that's kind of what we want with this paper and the forthcoming papers. Now, this is the reason why we got interested in, in all that, and that leads me to what do we mean by complexity-minded antitrust? First, I need to ask you a question, and for that, you can answer the questions in two different ways. You can first take a picture of the QR code. It would lead you to the question, or if you don't have a smartphone and a computer, you can go to slido.com. On the front page, you enter the hashtag BYU, and this will lead you indeed to that question. The question being, how familiar are you with complexity theory? The reason why I'm asking you the question is first to know wh what do I need to explain and also to be able to reuse the result of the polls, right, uh, in the future. I know, but more seriously, it's to inform the rest of my, of my presentation. Um, I can see that some people have started to vote so far, no one is very familiar with complexity theory. Some are familiar. Most of you are not familiar. And seemingly all of you at least have heard the name before. So with that in mind, and again, you can keep on voting. Um, I will try my best to be not on the very technical side of complexity theory. If you are interested in it, I'm more than happy to send you a list of books that you could get lost into. Um, but also, I won't take it from very... The, the ground zero. So the very basic idea of complexity theory, or also sometimes uh, dubbed complexity science, is to, and I insist on that point, study very simple interactions between agents, usually defined with very simple rules, and how all of those interactions put together are creating em emerging macro patterns, and how those interactions all together will change the environment in which the agents are evolving and how in turn the new environment has an effect, an effect on how the agents are behaving. This is mainstream in many of the fields of science. I've listed a few, uh, biology certainly, uh, history, physics, economics. Here I want to be more precise. You have a list over here of the fields where complexity science and all the tools that derive from complexity science are indeed mainstream and where you see that the papers being published do not even need to explain what complexity science is and why this is helpful. Um, but at least to the best of my knowledge, this is not mainstream in the legal field and even less so in antitrust, although as we know, antitrust is concerned with uh, uh, economics and economic thoughts. I just wanted to put that on the map to say that our ambition is not to come up with a weird, uh, never-tested theory or tool and to replace the entirety of what we have. This is why we called the paper Complexity-Minded Antitrust to, put it, to, to make it clear that our ambition is to work with what exists already but move toward more complexity as opposed to replacing all the rules and all the frameworks that we have because we think this won't be achieved anytime soon. Now, if I apply complexity theory to antitrust, that leads us to a very fundamental question. Um, I don't know, side note, if you know Cal Frinston, he's a neurobiologist, um, and you will see videos of Cal Frinston and he would ask questions that those are his research questions, such as, what is life? And we laugh a lot about that with Nicola, realizing that often in competition law, we ask very tiny questions. And both of us actually got interested in this question, what is competition? Of course, we can't provide a perfect answer to the question, but that informs a lot of what we do in this paper. And we think that you, at the very least, need to consider those four elements if you want to answer the question. The first being the organization of the firm. Anouk mentioned already David Thies, his work on dynamic capabilities. We often like to say that we want to open the firm black box in antitrust, but if you look at the case law um, and most of the recent decisions, there are literally no discussions as to the roles of managers, whether or not they are um, 
indeed in a position to put the companies on a good track or not, we usually tend to consider the firms are being those legal entities, and that's pretty much all that we do. And we think we need to understand the roles of the manager. Second of all, the business strategy. Uh, and here, this will trigger the need for retrospective studies. And I was delighted to hear this morning with the first keynote that indeed, you may use history, not for the sake of it, but to better understand and inform what's coming next. And we think this is indeed necessary. Third, the competitive environment. We think we need to stop looking at relevant markets one at a time and adopt a ecosystem view. I will be more specific in a minute. And fourth, the interactions between all of that. So which kind of competitive environments is triggering some capabilities, which capabilities will actually change the competitive environments, and so on and so forth. Now, all that is very abstract and theoretical. The problem that we had is that there, there are a few articles, they came up after the, the 90s for the most part, that tried to see if complexity science and this kind of mindset could inform antitrust. But most, if not all of those articles, at least the one we read, did not discuss the role of the agencies in shaping the ecosystem, which is again what Schumpeter did, right? Just looked at the economy and totally abstracted away the fact that there are antitrust agencies and that they may be effective, or on the contrary, that they may damage the economy. So that's really our ambition. And because I know most of us are lawyers and we may like a few tables and concrete definitions, I've put this table that we published in the paper and I just want to insist for a minute on three of those uh, variables. The difference between the way by which we apply antitrust today and what we propose when it comes to the preference is that we think we need to move away from the desire for plurality and or rivalry and move to a, a new paradigm where you would need and encourage change by default, right? Now, of course, change may not always be positive. This is why we say that the, the division of labor between antitrust and regulation might be that antitrust creates change, accelerates the economy, and this, this creates a problem, let's say, on labor uh, or worker rights, then the regulation may address those issues. Um, I'll give you two analogies related to, to running. If you run a 100 meter race and you are a grown up adult and all of your competitors, all of your rivals are two years old, you, don't, you, you do have rivals, but you have no competition, right? You know for a fact that you're gonna win that race. If I take another one with a marathon, what we see is that unless you are a very famous marathon runner, most likely, if you join a marathon, you are not of the ambition to win the marathon, right? And you are not the day you arrive taking someone totally random and saying to yourself, I'm going to beat this person. What you are doing is that you are running against yourself. So in a sense, you have no rivals, but the rival, the true rivalry is yourself and the uncertainty as to whether you will beat your best time running a marathon, right? And this is precisely what we want to encourage, which leads us to this. So our intuition is that the economy is becoming more complex, more interactions needed to produce. Of course, you can't compute all that. I cannot tell you where in a year from now or even where tomorrow Apple and Google will be when it comes to market caps and how many transactions and which types of products. Maybe it will be possible one day to compute the entirety of the world, but certainly not today. And so because of that, Firms are facing uncertainty, right? Google may have a sense of where Apple is going, but Google can't tell us precisely where Apple will be in a year from now. And this uncertainty, we argue, is actually what creates competition, right? The fact that you don't know and that you must do the best you can, as opposed to competition being created by rivalry, the fact that there are different players on the market, which is pretty much what we do in neoclassical uh, economic theory. So now, to make that very concrete in the last five minutes that I have, I want to discuss what do we do of all that. And I want to insist on this very specific point that it's not because the economy is complex that you need to create an antitrust 
um, body of rules and standards that is also complex, right? Meaning that no one can ever understand and that when the agencies face a case, they can't do anything with it because it's too complicated. What we think is that, again, because the interactions between the players are simple, it may be that the agencies will be able to also implement simple rules that will create an effect on the entirety of the ecosystem. Now, the key question is how do you increase uncertainty or how do you maintain complexity? That's pretty much uh, those are two um, questions that leads to the, the same kind of answer. And what I want to do before I give you something very concrete is to say that we are not providing agencies and law firm, as a matter of fact, with something which is written in stone, depending on your ideological preferences, the fact that you may fear type 1 errors or that you may be okay with type 1 errors and fear type 2 errors, you actually, within the kind of framework that we propose, will be able to put the, the cursor on a different scale. So to be very concrete, if you are scared of type 1 error, and this is the thing you want to avoid at all costs, what you may want to do under what we propose is simply to maintain random events, meaning to maintain the possibility that the ecosystem will change and move and the uncertainty. If on the contrary, you are okay with type 1 error and willing to butcher and massacre the entire market, then what you may want to do is to go way further and to introduce those events that will indeed create complexity to make sure that the firms do not know precisely how to make profits in the future, right? I'm not telling you where I will put myself on the scale, but it's up for, for you to figure it out. Now, this is what we think agencies can do. So we start with random events. This is again a concept usually um, commonly used in complexity science and theory. What we mean by that and what science mean by that is not an event that is totally random as to when the event can actually happen. It's an event that you can actually foresee, such as a regulation coming, such as the DMA being applied at the latest in March of 2024, but whose possible outcomes are equally uh, possible, right? And so we think that indeed, if you are Talking about digital markets, what you will see is that there are usually increasing returns as opposed to diminishing returns, meaning that the more people join, the more new people can derive something from the product. This is economic of scope, economic of scales, and meaning also that the more you produce, the cheaper it becomes for you to produce, right? Those are the increasing returns, such as uh, theorized by uh, Brian Arthur. And what we argue is that if you are in an ecosystem with increasing returns, this is certainly the case for all of the big tech companies, if you introduce a random event, what it will generate is a feedback loop that is positive. Now, positive doesn't mean that it's good and negative that it's bad. A negative feedback loop is something that will shake the market, but eventually will put the market in the initial situation. An example is that when you have fever, right? It's a negative feedback loop, you raise the temperature of your body, you expose the, the virus, and you return to the original state. What you see when there is an economy with increasing return is that those events are actually creating a positive feedback loop, meaning that the state of the ecosystem will never be the same. And if it's not the same and you can't predict, here you go, you have competition, and this is what we want. I'll give you some cases that you know and try to see if applying and Again, taking in, in, into account that the role of the agencies may be to maintain uncertainty or create complexity, what's, what, does it, what does it make as a difference in, in those cases? Facebook versus Bundeskartelamt. Uh, for those of you in the US, if you're not familiar with the case, the German competition agency fined Facebook. By the way, this is appealed now, and there is a preliminary ruling before the Court of Justice, so we'll see. But in any case, the German competition agency said, the fact that you, Facebook, combine the data coming out of Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp without telling the users is an abuse of your dominant position. Now, what we think is that the fact that Facebook did that actually helped Facebook becoming more dynamic and facing the competition coming out of new players such as TikTok in an ecosystem that is changing a lot. 
And in fact, you may know that Facebook is gaining users, past 3 billion users just this week, but each user is spending less time on Facebook than what used to be the case, right? So Facebook is facing this competitive pressure, and we think that this very specific practice increased uncertainty by creating uncertainty for TikTok. So in this case, we would say, OK, the practice is good, it's pro-competitive. Contrary to that, you have an ecosystem of Web3. Those are all the applications that you have running on top of blockchain. I could give you an example, DTube, DCNC, those are video sharing platforms, totally decentralized. But what we see is that the big tech companies, the Google and Facebook and Amazon of this world, control the infrastructure for those blockchain applications to function. A good example of that is the fact that you want, if you want to advertise something online, the best options that you have are Google, uh, Amazon, and to some degree, I'm told that Apple is soon entering the market, right? But in fact, what you see is that every Web3 product and service, they do have a Twitter account and they are pushing advertisements using the Web2 giants. And as a matter of fact, most of those Web2 giants are preventing any advertisement that is coming out of the Web3 world. Now, they may have good reasons for that, cybersecurity, consumer protection, but it might be that certain cases are a bit shady and that indeed big tech companies can freeze the ecosystem, therefore reduce complexity because they know precisely they can actually hamper Web3 developments, which is not good for competition. So here we would say, okay, we need to intervene. And probably the very same for the Microsoft case, right? By excluding Netscape, this was certainly not increasing complexity and uncertainty on the market. So in our view, this is certainly the type of practice that you will deem to be anti-competitive. Now, if I take just one minute, and I'm almost on time, I want to discuss very briefly what's coming next and what we can do as of today with all of that and when it comes to the tools and types of, of framework. Um, last week was the deadline for submitting comments to the European Commission in its willingness to reform the guidance for Article 102 of the TFEU, abuses of dominance. What we did with Nicola and uh, two other friends is that we published, sorry, we submitted a proposal for the European Commission to take into account what we call a dynamically as efficient competitor test. What agencies and courts are doing when considering if a competitor is as efficient is that they look at the two companies in a static way in 2023, right, end of April. And they would say, well, this company is more efficient, therefore this company has the right or it's okay if it eliminates another company that is not as efficient. What we say is that we need to take into account the time factor and consider if the small, less efficient company is to actually become as big as the other, if indeed that company will still be less efficient or not. And what we argue is that we can relax that test if there are ways to predict that indeed a small, less efficient player will become more efficient or as equally efficient if that player is to grow. This is the kind of player that you want because it creates uncertainty, right? And makes the market more complex. And how do you do that? Well, you can project the cost, see if there are economies of scales and scope in the business model of the less efficient player, and also, of course, the capabilities of that player. What about the documentation? Is there a business plan? What's the business plan saying? Do you see backing from venture capitalists or private equity? All of those are elements that may indicate that a less efficient player will become more efficient eventually, and therefore that we may want to protect that player and punish the anti-competitive practice. So this is a new legality test. When it comes to new tools, I've put a link this is a lot of fun. Please don't do that today during the conference. Um, but what you see here is a simulation in which you have uh, wolf and goats. And what you can do if you click on the link is that you can change the parameters of that simulation. You could say, okay, the rule is that if goat, if sorry, wolf meets goat, goat dies, right? Which is most likely the outcome. What you can do is that you can change how many goats and how many wolves do you have in a simulation, the speed by which they travel, and then play the simulation and see how, out of those very simple interactions and rules, it will create a totally different ecosystem and how the ecosystem evolves. So you see that sometimes 
there are many wolves, but if there are no more goats, then the wolf may die and therefore you have more goats. And we think that this is the kind of tool that you can use in antitrust. I'll show you something more sophisticated. I don't want the sound. Where is the sound? It's here. What you see here is a simulation developed by a company that I'm sure you've heard of, OpenAI, the one behind ChatGPT. What this company is also doing is what is called an agent-based simulation, where the two groups of agents, the blue and the red, are playing a game of hide and seek. Now, the beauty is that the more they play the game, the more they learn from the strategy of the other players, which we argue is exactly what the companies are doing, right? The companies don't, do not have a strategy they will follow for 10 years. They adapt to the other company's strategies. And if you are to play that video for a long time, you will see that indeed the red will learn from what the blue are doing and over time will access to the blue, but the blue will learn from that and therefore change the strategy. Now, what am I doing with a, on, with a computer scientist, not Nicola, but a computer scientist uh, from NYU is that we are trying to model if indeed we can simulate what's happening when it comes to agents willing to research the web. And what we did here in this simulation is that we've put all of the agents automatically on the bell curve on a scale where they, some of those agents may be privacy fundamentalists, so not willing to compromise with privacy, and some other agents, they are just here to maximize the quality of the product and the search. Our assumption is that if a company takes all of your personal data, there is a learning effect, and the company may get better eventually. If on the contrary, com the company is taking none of your personal data, then no learning effect, so the product will be more stable and more linear, right? So there is a trade-off between privacy and competition or the quality here of the product. And what we want to do is to simulate how the agents react to change in their environments. So first, what you see here is an environment in which there is just one company, Google, which we assume to be very good in terms of quality, but not so good in terms of privacy. What you see is that just a few agents will decide not to use Google because those are the privacy fundamentalists. And the others would say, well, I guess I have no choice. But if you introduce another one, let's say DuckDuckGo, not as good, but much better for privacy, then you will see how this will change the ecosystem. And what we are now in the process of doing is also to be able just clicking on a box to change the environments here, the legal environment, where you can introduce GDPR, you can introduce uh, the DMA, the DSA, and see how this changes the state of the ecosystem. The beauty of all that, in our view, is not to be able to say exactly who's going to use Google and DuckDuckGo, but to at least monitor and document the importance by which you may change the environment. Do you need first to push for new competitors or first for regulation? Depending on who you introduce or what you introduce first, what's the state of the ecosystem? This is forthcoming, but not published yet. The very last point, and I'll finish there, is the one of adaptive regulation or so-called real-time regulation. I'm sure all of you have heard that the law is lagging behind technology. Some people will complain and say, this is not good. If you give me a choice in between the law is lagging behind tech and the tech is lagging behind the law, I would definitely take the first, right? I prefer the lawyers to lag behind the technologists, but it might be that the best is actually for them to be happening and evolving at the very same time. This is what I proposed and I'm now researching when it comes to adaptive regulation, I will take a last analogy. Some researchers at the MIT are working toward creating adaptive regulation for re regulating speed on the highway. Um, what they argue is that it's actually non-effective to have the same limitation for all the cars, regardless of how many cars there is on the roads and what's the weather. It may be better to adapt with one objective in mind. Here you have to specify. The objective might be to reduce how many accidents there are and to say, well, that if it snows, well, maybe we need to decrease the speed and have something which is more dynamic and adapt to the real world condition. Well, I think we can do the exact same when it comes to antitrust. Some people would argue that antitrust law should be protecting sustainability. Now, my question is, how do you measure whether or not you can achieve that if indeed you change the antitrust rules, right? Because if you can't measure all that, then why would you do it? I mean, I guess for the political benefit of it, but that's not a scientific approach. 
So the first point I would argue is that, okay, if you want to change something or enact a new policy, tell me how you will measure whether or not you are effective. Then once you tell me that, I want to know which data you will actually scrape in the real world to document whether or not you are indeed effective and make the data public so that I can study whether or not there are biases in the data, if the data set is complete, incomplete, and so on and so forth. And what I will also want to see is for the agencies to tell me which are the thresholds that will indeed trigger change in the regulation based on the data. Whether it is to make the regulation stricter, maybe to abandon the regulation because it doesn't work. The idea, again, being to have an antitrust law which adapts real time to what you see on the market. What is key if you do that is to make all of those rules public to create legal certainty. And on that subject, there is a great paper by Edward Prescott, a Nobel laureate on time consistency and policy published in the end, at the end of the 80s that may give some clue as to how to implement all that. This is all I wanted to tell you. The very last point is that if you are interested in all of those issues, you may want to check the Dynamic Competition Initiative website. What we do is that we work with agencies to actually try to implement this kind of mindset. We have a bunch of scholars, and we also want to work with the industry. We are organizing a, a, a roundtable in Berkeley at the end of May uh, to, to better understand and connect all of those three words, which usually tends to be disconnected. So again, thank you very much. I'm sorry to be oh, that's great. over time and look forward, very much looking forward to your great comments. I must confess that we exchange emails, so I know it's going to be beautiful. Should I sit? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Have a seat. Thanks so much. Um, and again, like it. Thank you.